Digital Revive refers to the unequal access to information and communication technologies that there is currently in society. This divide is both global, where there are various countries where there is less than 5 out of 100 that have access to a personal computer, as well as local, where currently only 62% of Americans have access to broadband internet. While there is a digital divide, is primarily traditionally defined in terms of access. Access does not translate into the adequate use of technology. Others, including a recent Belgium science policy project, would argue that without digital literacy skills, despite having access, there would still be a form of digital divide. In this slide, I also added an image from an organization which works with previous inmates and other vulnerable groups to help them develop the computer science skills that would allow them to become more productive members of society and through that increase their self-esteem to possibly reduce or stop some of their negative behaviors. However, when we think of a technology adoption curve, there are different stages to a societal acquisition of a technology. And it is partly true that many times those with additional discretionary income are more likely to adopt a new technology quicker than others, especially if it's an expensive technology. However, this is not to say that there are problems that won't solve themselves over time. In addition, as can be seen from the Pew study results, 20% of respondents who currently lack for the answers in the United States, responded that they did not want to switch and were satisfied with their current access to technology. An adoption curve happens with every innovation. They are natural and at times all that is needed is for the technology to decrease in price, for it to become increasingly accessible to a new group of individuals. This has happened over time as computers we carry in our pockets are more powerful today that ones that used to cost thousands of dollars. Here in this picture, for example, you see the original price of one of the first personal computers, the Xerox 8010 with $17,000 to one of the first, uh, the first Macintosh, Lisa, and then Macintosh, the first Apple, Lisa, and the first Macintosh. Um, and you can see the decrease in price, but even the first Macintosh, $2,500 will be very expensive today in comparison to an iPad. Prices per computer processing power have decreased dramatically over time. Many would argue with Raymond Kurzweil that these changes have been exponential. However, can people afford to wait? As technology influences more and more the economy, the lack of digital literacy skills may be limiting the potential of a segment of society that may be primarily of a particular race or socioeconomic status. If access to information and technology is increasingly perceived as a right, then individuals without access are to some extent disadvantaged and marginalized. However, there is a reason to believe that the most important barrier, the access to the internet may be already being increasingly eroded. It has been eroded quite quickly as a result of the leapfrogging technology of the mobile phone, which is increasingly prevalent in the United States as well as developing parts of the world. Today there are over 5.3 billion mobile subscriptions worldwide, out of a population of 7 billion that includes toddlers and children. However, this is somewhat misleading because in cities, many have a large number of people have more than one phone. However, it's clear that access has increased. Nevertheless, in places such as Africa, particularly Sub Saharan Africa, there is a lack of access to the internet, with less than 10% being connected to the World Wide Web and its information. Then we can we ask also ourselves, when does the device become essential and helps people develop a new type of capital? Well, 
newer devices that are currently seen as a luxury may not be always seen as a luxury. If we look at devices that today may be seen as essential, such as a cell phone or having a laptop in college, they used to be considered luxuries as well. The problem with this, though, is that not every technology ends up being adopted by the mass market. Some of them don't go through the chasm between early adoption and the early majority. So with that in mind, it is, it should, it should, is waiting just the right idea, the right uh, decision to take? Or uh, what policy needs to be implemented with what technologies to decrease the digital divide? Therefore, a divide in terms of device would likely continue to be present. However, um, there is an economics of the digital divide, and uh, this links to uh, how we define a basic good and a luxury good. And uh, I mean, when we think, well, we could be comparing personal computers, or we could be talking just about the internet, or we could be talking also about access to an iPad or a dumb phone. Today, most of the time, the digital divide is referred to in terms of uh, access to broadband or lack of access to broadband, um, access to the internet in general, or no access to the internet. Um, but even, I mean, you could see the adoption rate of the television, for example, as well. And uh, many technologies, you could include those that have it and those that don't have it but just some technologies are considered as a more basic technology and some are seen more as a luxury. What is increasingly important, however, is that people are able to link up through the internet and benefit from learning from their peers and from the accumulated knowledge that is being collected because of modern technologies. Increasing access to the internet is seen by many as a top priority. As discussed by Mark Washhauser, without taking into account the context and the need of the local community, as well as including the community in the process of technology transfer and adoption, the investment could have a marginal impact or no impact and take away very valuable resources from other sectors where it could have a greater benefit to society. Yet. The more people that have access to information and are able to learn new skills through the use of technology, the more we will be able to contribute to the economy and they will be able to create new industries. Many developing countries are primarily monoproductive in terms of exports, uh, exporting raw resources. By increasing human capital in a society, however, its individuals will contribute to creating a more diverse and stable economy that can better withstand market price fluctuation. So all in all, when we think of the digital divide, it's not a simple concept. There's many uh, elements to it. And um, it, it's about those that have it and those that don't have access, or those that have the skills or those that don't have the skills. So that would be a second order digital divide. But I mean, it's, it's about that gap. And what is important in education is how that relates for example, to the achievement gap or future success in the job market. And um, I mean, not just the tool, but what is the purpose of the tool and what it will do for society. So not all technologies are positive technologies. Um, many of them are. So having the ability to know how to use a technology, if it's a helpful technology, it's always beneficial and helping people be better at using these technologies is a valuable aim in policy and for educators.